All right. So I'm just going to treat this as a lecture on the board. So you guys will see this. Uh, you can see this, correct? Yeah, you bet. Okay, here we go. So fundamentals analog loops, and that's 3101031A. So the objectives here, there's 10 of them, so there's quite a few objectives, so um, it doesn't take a ton of time. But we're just talking about the loops, and uh, we're talking about uh, um, loop resistance, and we're talking about current uh, loops and voltage loops and why we use current over voltage. And then we do maximum loop calculations, and you'll be doing that in the lab also. You'll be loading up a loop until it really doesn't work anymore. Um, we talk about the 250 ohm resistor that's in parallel with our um, devices, such as chart recorders or whatever they are. And if we all know that uh, 20, uh, 250 ohm resistor, if I've got a 4 to 20 milliamp signal at 4 milliamps, it gives us a 1 volt, and at 20 milliamps, it gives us 5 volts. So that signal is going to be 1 to 5 volts through that uh, 250 ohm resistor. Okay, so the objective described the standard signals used in industry, measurements, and control loops. Calculate loop output between various standards. Uh, again, this number two here is going to be your input output formula, which we use all the time. Uh, describe why current rather than voltage is primary use for signal transmission. Uh, we're going to illustrate an instrument loop using two wire transmitter. Uh, one of the things that you guys have to do is you'll have to be able to hook up a transmitter, obviously, and, uh, and you can by now. Um, when we had a TQ, they had a transmitter that had to be all hooked up in the TQs. Um, since we don't have a TQ anymore, I'm not sure if we have to uh, do one of these questions, but anyway, we'll talk about it, and they're fairly easy. Illustrate an instrument loop using a four-wire transmitter. So four-wire transmitters themselves, like a two-wire, uh, supplies, supplies the power to the loop. We're going to have a four-wire transmitter. The two wires are actually um, our power wires, and the other two are the loop wires. And the reason for that is if your loop requires a lot of power, we use a four-wire transmitter. In this case, uh, something like um, um, the one I use is the mag meter. Uh, any mag meter requires a lot of power, so that loop itself would be a four-wire system where I would two of those wires would just be power wires, and we'll talk about that. Objective uh, three: Describe the currents used to test the output of the transmitter without interrupting the current flow. Uh, we do that when we go to a transmitter and we go across the test leads. When we're going across that test leads, we have a silicon diode. And that voltage drop across that silicone diode is 0.7 volts. And so when you are looking for current in a loop, if you open that loop, you're going to shut down your loop. Uh, when you have a current, when you have a transmitter that's got that uh, test leads, basically all it is is it's it's a um, uh, it's a forward bias diode, so it's allowing current to flow through. And then when we put our meter across. Um, we can actually um, test for the current in that particular loop without opening the loop, so it stays running. Uh, describe the current to voltage relationship of an analog control loop. Calculate the maximum loop resistance for a current loop. Uh, describe the test procedures used to calibrate and troubleshoot in analog loops. And the last thing is predict how the loop could be affected by common circuit faults. So the 10 objectives, they go fairly quickly. So standard instrument signal transmission, as you guys know, um, we're talking about how do the instruments communicate with each other, what are the standard instrument signals. And we have the pneumatic signals, of course, and that's usually 3 to 15 PSI or 20 to 100 kPa. Um, most of us still use that 3 to 15 PSI, but there is a lot of kPa being used out there. Uh, you have 6 to 30 PSI. I don't see that signal very much. My electrical signals, of course, are 4 to 20 milliamps. And then, of course, 10 to 50 milliamps, which I don't see very much. And then 1 to 5 volts. And that 1 to 5 volts comes from your 250 ohm resistor. So 
in this case, if you notice that all the lower range values are not zero, anybody tell me why I don't have zeros for my lower range value? You have to turn on your mic. Does anybody know why we don't have a zero for a lower range value? Okay, so you guys are shy. I'll tell you. So this is called the live zero offset, and it's purposely done. And the reason it's perfectly done is to distinguish between zero and no signal. So if I've got a zero, um, and or which is my lower range value is going to be in this case, if it's PSI, it's three. If it's uh, milliamps, it's four. But it distinguishes between a zero and no signal. So if I've got a if I've got a transmitter loop that's uh, driven by a milliamp signal, and I, I I have a wire cut, well that will go to no signal. It will go to zero. If if the the uh, loop is working still, I'm and but I've got a low value of four. I know that it's something else other than this wiring in that uh, in that loop. So this is why we have a live offset zero. So better instruments, transmitters respond to a, a, a signal above zero also. So zero is a poor signal for most transmitters and instruments. So we use something above zero and it just gives us a better response. A current loop of four milliamp powers two wire control loops. So when I have that four milliamp signal, it's still powering up the loop. Linear inter inter interpolation, that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Finding the linear value between the output of the transmitter to the measurement measured value. And again, this is our input-output formula. So where LIV is one milli, um, meters and the upper range value is six meters and the tank level is three meters, what is the output signal in a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter? So again, this is a situation I'm looking at. I've got a lower range value of one meters. I got upper range value of six, but I got three meters in the tank. Uh, how many milliamps is that transmitter putting out? Again, there's my signal. My, uh, my input output formula, and we'll be using that in all of your school. So output is equal to uh, input minus lower range value of the input divided by the span of the input times the span of the output plus the lower range value of the output. So there's, um, there is a exercise or that you can do in, um, in the course content, it says worksheets, and there is one on analog, well, there's, there's one on each one of my ILMs uh, in, in this electronics. So formula is on page three of your formula sheet, so you have that formula, you don't have to remember it. And then of course output, if I look at this and I'm doing my calculations, uh, I've got my input is three meters high minus my lower range value, which is one meter divided by my span, one to six meters, a span of five meters. And then if I look at my output, I've got a 16 milliamp span, but I have to add the four milliamps at the end because that's my lower range value of, of, of that output. And if we look at that, I got 10.4 milliamps. These should become pretty easy and standard for you guys to do as, uh, as far as the input output formulas. And you can go vice versa, right? This is the output formula. The input formula would just be uh, uh, basically, it was it would be just transposing this. So find the linear uh, value between the output and the input of transmitters using the input formula where the lower range value is one meter upper range is six. And it's just, again, it's another one that you're going to use your output, input output formula. It's telling me that uh, my lower range value is one meter to same tank, but this time I'm getting an output of 11.11 milliamps. And what is my input? So there's that input formula again that we'll be using. Uh, this, we've got my output of 11.11 uh, milliamps minus my four milliamps, which is my lower range value, divided by my span of my output, which is 16 times five meters plus one meter. And we get 3.22 meters. <clears throat> Next objective, calculate loop output between various standards. 
It says, although there are different control signal standards, the most common method of converting these standards is through electronic to pneumatic signals or current to voltage signals. So electric signals to pneumatic signals, I to P. So we all know what this I to P is by now. Pneumatic signals to electric is P to I. Current to voltage, signal converters are needed to convert IP or CV. These converters are called transducers. So when I'm looking at my, uh, my transducer, my CV, uh, current to voltage, I, I use these transducers. And that's what the, you, can all, you always heard that term transducer and that's what it is. It's a signal converter. A device that converts various um, physical quantities such as pressure, brightness into electrical signals or vice versa. And it doesn't have to be electrical, it could be, volt, uh, could be current or could be voltage. I to P converters receive 16 milliamp signal. What is the input uh, KPA 20 to 100 KPA range was used? Again, here's our input output formula. So get used to this. Uh, it's easy. It's in your, as you say, in your formula sheet and it's easy marks. And then we just go through that. Uh, my input is 16 milliamp signal. Uh, my lower range value, of course, is four. Uh, that's my span of 16 milliamps. My span out, if you look at that, it's 80. So 20 uh, kPa to 100 is 80 kPa. And then my lower range value, of course, is 20. So it gives me an 80 kPa. So again, what, I want to do a couple of these and uh, some easy, easy correct marks on your exams. Current to voltage conversion. Although 4 to 20 milliamp is most common, most receivers will accept a 1 to 5 volt signal. So here's my, here's my actual loop. And if you can notice here that we've got through my loop, this is, this is a two wire loop. So it's powered, self powered, four to 20 milliamp loop. And then I've got a controller here and then I've got a recorder here and I got a 250 ohm resistor across or in parallel with each one of these devices. So when I'm looking at a four milliamp going through here, this device is ha gonna have a one volt out in input. And if it's safe as 20 milliamps, it will have a five volt input. If it's required to use a voltage input, it's necessary to place the uh, precision 250 ohm resistor in series, all right? You don't wanna have something other than 250 ohms because it just won't work. And, and the other thing about this 250 ohm resistor, if you're going to put on a, uh, a um, communicator, um, you need a 250 ohm minimum resistance on a loop so that, that uh, communicator can actually function and communicate. There's my 250 ohm resistors. Current to voltage conversion, what is the voltage dropped on a 250 ohm resistor if the current flowing is 9.5? So again, this is just, uh, you can do this as a input output formula, which is pretty difficult or you can just use Ohm's law. If I know I got 5 milliamps and I know I got 250 ohm resistors, I know what I'm going to get for a voltage. Um, you're looking at milliamp multiplied by uh, your ohmic value, and that's going to give you your voltage. Uh, or you can use the input output formula. Ohm's law, current drops and voltage is constant in a parallel circuit. We know that, so my reference in a parallel circuit is voltage. Each branch has the same amount of voltage. Voltage drops and current is constant in a series circuit. Uh, so in this case here, I've got current is my, uh, is my reference in a series circuit because it doesn't matter where in the circuit the, the, the current is, it's always the same. So Ohm's law is E is equal to I times R. This is important because how many we choose, which loop uh, to, to be based on is Mr. Ohm's law. Hopefully this is familiar from last year. There are two types of signal transmission, voltage and current. Let's compare them both. So in this case here, I've got a voltage. I've got one to five volt, and it's it's actually, um, so that's my transmission is, is the voltage. The problem with the voltage is we'll talk about it. We know that voltage has to equal voltage out. So that's, uh, that's Kirchhoff's law, voltage law. So the sum of the voltage drops here, um, basically, loop signal is one volt or zero percent and five volts for 100 percent 
Um, if I look at these uh, resistors that are called R line, that's the resistance of the line. So as we know that if we have longer longer lines or longer uh, supply lines or whatever, we are going to have IR drops or we're going to have heat building up on those wires, which is called resistance of the lines. So those resistance of the lines cause a voltage drop. Uh, so if I've got a voltage drop, it could mess up my uh, receiver. Uh, it doesn't, it might not give me the, the correct reading. Depends on how, um, how long my lines are. Now, if you have uh, short loops, sometimes uh, the voltage transmission will work. But if you have the longer loops, you have too much voltage drop on the lines. So we will have to consider the voltage drops in the series circuit wiring. Wire resistance, volt drops, plus receiver volt drops, that will equal a signal value. So in this case here, I got one to five volts and a receiver. In this case one, I've got uh, my resistance of my line is, is 25 ohms, and I've got a receiver that's 250 ohms. So if I do my calculation, I've got, um, I got five volts here, so the voltage are crop uh, drop across this receiver. I got 250 ohms, but my total is 200, 250 plus two times 25 because that's going to be my line resistance and that's going to give me a volt drop of 4.167. So in this case here, I don't have enough voltage, right? Because I will never get to the five volt drop across the receiver. So I have an error of 0 0.33 volts or 17%. Of course, this is the voltage divided rule where I'm looking for the voltage drop across the resistor and then I've got total resistance here. Case two, I've got a resistive line 25, but I got a receiver 1K ohm. So if I've got a receiver that's a high impedance, 100, uh, this is like 1,000 ohms, the voltage drop of the receiver, I've got five volts here. I'm looking at the receiver of 1K, and I'm looking at 1K plus the 2 times 225 ohm resistance across each line, and my voltage drop here across the receiver is 4.76. So you can see that it's improved quite a bit, and that's by having a high resistance in my receiver. That way, the more current flows through that, and I get more of a voltage drop from my receiver than I do on the lines, again, using my voltage or my my ohmic value and then a case three if i really increase my uh resistance in my receiver i got a voltage drop of five and then using my relationship here between uh the receiver resistance and then the total resistance and and multiply that together i get 4.9997 which is an error of 0 0.003. So it's saying if you're using a voltage transmission uh, signal loop, you better have a high impedance on the receiver because it will drop most of that across the receiver and not the lines. Overview, must have a high receiver resistance in order to get an accurate voltage signal. As receiver resistance gets higher, noise becomes more of a problem. Resistance uh, of a line can change with temperature and this can be a negative factor. Short circuit, a voltage source creates high current flow, which will blow fuses and potentially injure people if it's, if it's uh, in this case, we have a short. Limited to short distances. So any of these voltage supplied lines are limited to very short distances. And no, overall, not that good. And you don't see many of them out there. So let's talk about current. And this is a 40, 20 milliamp current transmission. So here's my, here's my loop diagram with 40, 20 milliamp current. So this is going through my lines again. Now I have a 250 ohm resistor that's here and it's across, um, the, that, so the voltage across here is going to be the same as the voltage across here, one to five volts. So in case one, we got my R line is zero ohms. And then I've got I is equal to 20 milliamps. So the volt receiver would be 20 milliamps times 250 is five volts. And when my volt line is 20 milliamps times zero, I get zero volts. 
So the total voltage here is five. So that's pretty, uh, this is what we're looking for anyway, is, is five volts across my receiver. Uh, case two, my, my resistance of my line is 20 ohms. And then of course my I is 20 milliamps. The voltage across receiver is 20 milliamps times 250 ohms, because if I've got 20 milliamps going through here, it's 20 milliamps everywhere. So it does go through here and I get a volt drop of five volts. So you can see how accurate this is um, with, with current being uh, the transmission of the, of the loop. So the voltage of line uh, is 20 milliamps um, times 40 ohms, which is equal to 0.8 volts. So the total volt total that I have to supply to this thing is going to be 5.8 volts. Now, when you look at a, look at a transmitter and you uh, look at the specs of the transmitter, it's going to tell you the voltage that it requires to run. So that voltage plus the loop voltage has to be above the total voltage of the uh, of the loop, or it won't work. And this is what you'll be doing in lab. You'll be you'll have a receiver. You'll have 24 volts. You'll keep adding 250 ohm resistors to your loop, and you'll see it fail after because we don't have enough voltage that supplies um, to to get accurate readings. Current transmission again. This is case three. I've got a 5k ohm. My line is 5k. I still have my current at 20 milliamps. My receiver, 20 milliamps times 250 equals 5. And then if I get my line voltage, I get 20 milliamps going through here, but I got 10K. So I need 200 volts. So this is my issue here now. So the total voltage needed to run this loop is 205 volts. And as you can see, that gets pretty high up there, especially when we're looking at something like a 24-volt system. So advantage of the current signal, changes in uh, line resistance due to changes in ambient temperature do not affect the voltage drop across the load resistor. Noise is less of a problem because it's a 40, 20, milli 20 milliamp signal and your one to five volts is dropped across a 250 ohm resistor at the transmitter. So your line noise, it, it's not, it really doesn't affect it. Short circuit in the system will allow for blown fuse. Well, not blow fuse, I should say because it's such a low, uh, uh, um, a low current. Disadvantages of current signals, there'll be a maximum loop resistance at which the power supply can no longer drive a current signal. So again, if I load up my signal and I have too much uh, um, resistance on my signal, then I won't get four to 20 milliamps through it because I don't have enough voltage to push it through. So I'll have to increase my voltage. Objective four, two wire transmitter. This is the most common transmitter. Its job is to regulate current through itself using a Zener regulator. Now, you know from second year that Zener regulators are actually uh, voltage regulators. It says to a value that is proportional to the sensor signal. Current is not produced, but rather regulated by the two wire transmitter. So in this case here, this is a two wire transmitter. Power supply is 24 volts. Got a couple of recorders here with 250 ohm resistors across it for a one to five volt drop. There's my positives. This is how we hooking this up. So if I've got a positive uh, from my in my field transmitter, positive to there, positive there, negative to positive to negative to positive to negative to positive nuts to, or negative to negative at the end is how we hook up a two wire transmitter. So those are the negatives, 250 ohm resistors, convert one to five volts. Two wire transmitters must have an external voltage source. It must be hooked up positive to positive and negative to negative. Um, throughout the loop though, you're gonna go to a positive to a negative and then in that uh, receiver or whatever we have, we go from negative to positive, positive to negative, and then negative to negative to, to find to end the circuit right here. So this goes positive to positive, then you go negative to positive, then this wire is, is uh, positive to negative, negative to positive, and then the negatives meet up at the end of the loop. Transmitter receives its power for overall signals uh, and is protected from reverse polarity by a shunt diode. 
Now this uh, shunt diode from uh, second year, as you know, these diodes are forward biased or reverse biased. So power source is uh, usually remote in the control room or control building, but the I.O. for that area is located. Shunt diode is also allowed for testing without uh, breaking the loop. This is a four wire transmitter. Next, objective five. So in this case here, we have our control loop, order 20 amps control loop. But here we have a supply, a voltage supply here of 120, 60 hertz, whatever it is. Uh, it could be 24 volts, but whatever the transmitter requires. So this is a loop that requires more power, such as, as I said, magnetic. So in the four wire transmitter system, it is a trans, uh, transmitter that generates the current source, power supplied to, uh, by separate wires, and normally it says uh, 120 volt DC. Four wire transmitters are typically used where the sensor has a large power requirement. Magmeters and some other mass flow devices utilize coal, uh, that utilize coils that require more power. So how can we test the current signal? Objective number six. Well, if normally we put the ammeter in series, but you can see if we uh, have to break the loop, then that loop is broken and it may cause problems with our process. So this is how we usually do it. But that if we if we put an ammeter in here, we're going to get the best readings. And to be honest with you, when we do any calibrations, we have to use use this to calibrate. We cannot have a live loop. We never calibrate a live loop um, because it gives us errors. But I've known in the field what we have done. Um, if you go up to a loop that's out uh, in the field and just make sure you tell your operators that you're going to work on it, um, then you can manual and then you can actually go out there and, and, and calibrate. Or you can calibrate from anywhere on the loop, wherever it is. So this is how we usually do it but it requires taking the loop out of service and this can be problematic in an operating facility. Again, I can't break that loop. So I can't just put my ammeter in, in, in series. So here it is, here's how we do that. And, and a lot of us have gone through uh, with a communicator or some sort uh, and go across the test leads. And this across the test leads, and I'll show you the diagram, is where that zener, not the zener diagram, the, um, this, the silicone diode is, is. So test terminals are provided in the most in most transmitters. This is an alternative. You utilize the diode in series to break the current for measurement. It does come with the caveat, however. Again, that caveat is not to be able to calibrate through there. And you, we do and we can, but we all have it won't be as as uh, accurate calibration as if we open the loop. So here it is here. We have a, sh a shunt diode. It's got a 0.7 volt breakdown here. Um, so this is what's across our, this is what's across our uh, test leads. So the shunt diode is what makes the test terminals useful. It isolates the loop and lets the current flow through the meter. Again, the meter, when we put a meter on here, it has a high resistance, so our current's going to flow through here. Um, but remember, we lose that 0.7 volt drop because that we never take that out of series. We never open this up because if we do, we've lost the loop. So normal current flow here. So it comes down through here without uh, a, a communicator or anything attached to the test. That just flows this way. So if I get a digital voltmeter here, then this takes off and flows through the digital multimeter and then back through. So this is where we'll, we'll, we can get our amperage and we can test for amperage and see what 4 to 20 milliamp signal is doing or a communicator again, we can hook up right to here, right? So we never ever broke the loop because all we're doing is bypassing this diode, this shunt diode. And that's why it's called a shunt diode is because we, we actually, um, our di digital multimeter will pick up the current through here, which is called uh, by this shunt diode. By measuring the voltage drop across a series resistor, we can calculate the uh, current flow. Voltage measurements are 20 times less accurate than current measurements. So we're not looking for a voltage drop across it, we're looking for current flow. 
this is this is cool too. If you guys have these uh, these clap on ammeters, they're very. Uh, when I was in the field, they didn't. Well, I didn't have one in my in my tool pouch anyway. But they've developed a milliamp clap meter utilizing the Hall effect. The sensors that are gaining popularity is they do not require breaking the loop, and the signal is more pure than the uh, than the test point terminals. Um, one of the things we used to do is we used to have uh, very sharp terminals, and we can actually uh, pierce the insulation of the wires, so we could test voltage drops and things like that. But that's not great because you're degrading the the, um, the actual insulation. So that this is what those, these clamp-on ammeters are like. Again, this is a flute, and then of course the wires are very or the hole in here is very small. It's just like a clamp-on ammeter for. Um, the electricians use for larger currents, but this one is such a small little wire that's just for the quarter 20 milliamp. So they're kind, they're kind of good to have, in, especially if you're um, wanting to find out what the current is, and they're fairly accurate. And then you don't have to use it. You could you could put this on any part of the loop because, as we know, the loop is a series circuit, and anywhere in that loop, we're going to have the same current. Okay, so basically here we're talking about uh, this is due to the fact that there may be small amounts of leakage through the diode. So that's why there will be some leakage through the diode of current. And this can be often seen as at the meter. Use these for troubleshooting, not calibration. Now this here again, we can because we're not uh, we are actually measuring the amp through the whole loop. These are more accurate than would be from the test points as far as the current is going. But we can't we can't calibrate from there. Current to resistant uh, voltage relationship, so back to seven. This relationship is different for the input circuit um, compared to the output circuit. If uh, if we send a four to twenty milliamp signal and it passes through a two hundred fifty ohm resistor, it's converted to a one to five volt. Output on the output side, we send a four to twenty milliamp. But the end device may have different load resistances. Uh, this causes a different amount of voltage to be dropped. And we then have to trim the end user for this value. OK, uh, maximum loop resistance. So my RL max, so my resistance of the loop maximum, is equal to the voltage supplied by the voltage minimum. And again, when we supply this voltage, uh, this voltage supply, it's got to power up the transmitter as well as anything that's on the loop. So we have Vs minus V minimum and divided by 20 milliamps because that's the maximum milliamps we have in our loop. So formula is based on page 8 of the formula sheet. So you'll see that where RL is the maximum resistance of the loop. Your RS is the voltage supply. And your R minimum is the minimum voltage that a transmitter can operate. So if I've got the loop and it's got um, a 4 to 20 milliamp going through it and it's got a whole bunch of these 250 ohm drops, we need to supply the um, transmitter as well as the loop. Or it will, will not work. And as I say, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see that in, the, in the, one of your labs. And 20 milliamp is current, and that's the upper range value. So we're calculating the loop. The loop consists of a transmitter that requires 16 volts to operate, a 24 volt power supply, a recorder, and a controller that each requires one to five volt input. What's the maximum allowable loop resistance of this? So, of course, we're going to be using Ohm's law here. So it says, I've got a 24 volt supply. My transmitter needs 16 volts. And then I have 20 milliamps is my max going through that. So my maximum loop resistance can be 400 ohms. It says, therefore, the loop will not operate properly because each of the load requires less than 500 ohms, 2 times 250 ohms for signal conversions. So this is what you have to be doing in your calculation. Again, RL max equal to supply, and then the minimum for the transmitter operate, and then the 20 milliamps, we use the maximum loop current. 
So a loop consists of transmitter tra that uh, requires 12 volts to operate, a 24 volt power supply, a recorder, and a controller that each requires live volt input. So again, I've got uh, five volts, 10 volts across each one, maximum of 10 volts across the 250 ohm resistor. And I've got 24 volts here. And then I've got 12 volts that's required to operate the, the, the transmitter. So you look at this here, you get 24 volts minus 12. And it looks like I got a 600 ohm max for my maximum loop resistance. Therefore, the loop will operate properly as each node requires two times 250 ohm for signal conversion. So this is below uh, the maximum loop resistance. Another one, uh, smart tram transmitters are a little different. When they fail, they can drive the output signal higher than 20 milliamps or lower than 4 milliamps. And this is where we're telling you about a live zero. Well, also, depending if they fail on the way up or the upper range value or they fail on the lower range value, they will um, actually signal that they have failed or something's gone wrong with the loop. And that's on, just on the smart transmitter. An analog, an analog transmitter wouldn't, wouldn't know or wouldn't even see it. But the smart transmitters can do that and they can send a signal uh, to the control board or whatever you're using. And the name year 43, any 43 standard. Um, basically, if this standard uh, supplies the, uh, the low alarm as well as the high alarm. So if I'm using the, the uh, name year N43 standard, the low is 3.8 milliamp saturation. So if it's, it's, if it's less than or equal to 3.6 milliamps, you get an alarm. Notice that you're still getting milliamp signal, so it's not a wire issue. It's, it's an issue with something else other than the wire failing. And on a high with the name year 43, you get 20.5 milliamp saturation. And if it's uh, greater, that, greater or equal to 22.5 milliamps, you will get an alarm. The reason we show others the name your standards because there's other standards too. So depending what standard that, that uh, is um, set up in your transmitter, um, there could be different high and low range saturation points. Again, here's a saturation point in North America. So we've got 3.9 milliamps saturation. So if it's, uh, if it's less than or equal to 3.75, you get an alarm. And then of course, 20.8 20 milli, 20 milliamp saturation. So if it's um, greater or equal to 21.75 milliamp alarm, you will get an alarm too. So calibration troubleshooting objective nine. I'm looking at primary concern when troubleshooting is not shutting down the plant. This is huge. This will be on your TQ, or not your TQ, your IP. When they talk about uh, shutting down a plant, uh, they're talking about going out there and opening up a, um, a loop that has basically severe consequences to the way the plant runs, and you could shut the plant down. And that's why when you have a calibrator there that always asks you, when, you, when you're talking about it, have a calibrator communicator, it says, do you really want to turn this on? Do you really want to turn? So it asks you in, in the communicator. So you're responsible for notifying the operations of the work you are going to be doing before starting your work. Uh, follow pre-check procedures, warn ops, so you warn your operations. It's going to be possibly a signal disruption. Replace controllers in manual if you can, if you have a manual switch. That way, once it's in manual, and of course, this is going to be a bumpless transfer that we talked about before. Uh, you disable alarms and shut down if required, and bypass any control valves if required. Now, if you have if you have the luxury of doing calibrations in your shop, that's the best place. But you still have to break the loop to put a new calibrate new ca um, transmitter in. So loop calibrations; these are a great tool for instrument techs. So we, with these calibrations, you measure current. You can source current to unpowered instruments, and those are these 724s or whatever you've got um, with these calibrators, um, 375. Even the new Trex, the, the Trex are awesome. And they can they can measure current and they can source current 
and simulate new power. Many fluke meters offer this option, but there are cheaper, pur uh, cheaper purpose-built tools that are smaller and work very well also. I always promote to uh, fluke because I think that's one of the best ones that I've come across anyway. Calibrations, all calibrations are specific to your workplace. And um, at the end of these ILMs, it always goes through a calibration procedure. So that, that's what you'll be using. Transmitter calibrations, control input calibrations, controller output calibrations. So those are the trims and the zeros, all that kind of stuff. The IDP tr uh, transducer calibrations. And the specifics are all in your ILM. So you can read through those. Common circuit faults, short uh, blown fuse or fault milling up level. Grounded wires, negative uh, might still work, positive won't work. Open circuit, transmitter's dead, so power at break point. Transmitter failure will drive high or low. If it's a smart transmitter, it'll drive high and low and signal. So if barrier failure, no power out, but power in is okay. Power supply failure, if you, if you lose your power supply, you don't have any anything driving that 4 to 20 mm signal or your Transmitter, blown fuse, dead noise, uh, and this noise is erratic signals on your on your milliamp loop, milliamp loop, and that's it. So in a nutshell, we went through a little bit of analog loops, uh, which is our first subject in electronics for third period. Um, so with you guys, if you have any questions, um, you can certainly email me and I can uh, respond. As I say, I'm in class uh, Monday to Friday with the second years now. So if you have any questions or any um, issues, just email me. That's the best way that I can, uh, I can answer your questions. So let me get out of here.